I really said it was all mesmerizing, and there was a lot of demand that the session would have been in English. Be that as it may, I would just ask you since you are so thorough and your entire focus was you how to funnel the facts, how to focus the fact in a pyramid structure. If the session was to be in English, and I just ask you to sum it up, how you have to make an appeal in bus in just five minutes. For those who have missed the other way around, let's have it in five minutes in an uh, in an English. That how what how has to be done. As I uh, started, I'll repeat it. Appeals are of three categories. One appeals against conviction. Second appeals against acquittal. One can easily say that these constitute almost ninety-five percent of criminal appeals. The other five percent of criminal appeals are those which are under special statutes where you are allowing different orders to be challenged, but those are only in special statutes which provide for the only redressal and only challenge is under an appeal. So, why, by and large, focusing only on the appeals of against acquittal or conviction, I had started by saying that. the recent judgment of supreme court where it talks of asking the lawyer the, what was reported was the judges asking the lawyer to narrate only the facts and like a fiction writer don't lose sight of the fact so the what my uh, uh, what i had started by saying was that uh, that's only reiterating what has always been the version appeal is different from any other challenge appeal is a statute providing you a reappraisal of evidence so the court can on the same set of facts and evidence find a different judgment a different conclusion can be brought on that so you are talking of reappraisal of evidence so if there is a reappraisal of evidence if we want the judge to look at the evidence in the manner in which we want him to look because we are challenging and assailing the findings of the trial court or the uh, first appellate court it is imperative for us to don't let him stray on the trial court judgment or the impugned judgment reason being every judgment has its own reasons and once reasons are given this is a way of looking at the evidence so to, rather than allowing the uh, appellate court to look at the evidence in the manner in which you want you will be giving him the uh, fodder to look at the evidence in which the impugned judge impugned judgment has looked so to keep him under check and hand hold him across the path you need to keep it to the way in which you want him to look at for that purposes one must marshal the facts and facts must be so marshaled that because in a criminal appeal you are talking of an incident that has happened an incident which how it unfolded how the event unfolded and not just that how Uh, things have been recorded in the evidence, so you'll need to take the judge through. Say at uh, nine o'clock, so and so is stated to have said this or done this, and at nine uh, fifteen, uh, information reaches the police. At nine twenty, the police party leave their uh, police station and go to the spot. At nine thirty-five or nine forty, they reach. This is the first thing that they recorded. This is the DD entry, and the. Uh, how it uh, was recorded and information sent by the pcr or the police or whatever so that narration must have a time flow once you have and that in your grip you and you are unfolding the events to the judge you are basically trying to relay a, a story you are creating a picture before him a drishyam before him so when you are creating that picture before him you are going to have him see it in your way you would want him to have because you are going as per the evidence and you are telling this is the evidence and how the evidence has uh, brought out the unfolding of the facts 
In the meantime, you'll have to intersperse this narration with the important steps that take place under the process. The process could be uh, the the CRPC process or what the normal, uh, uh, like going to a hospital or getting the MLC, then the doctor has examined and the doctor has sent him for an X-ray or doctor has sent for stitches or something, any other thing of that, that sort. So the process could be either, either those prescribed under the CRPC or procedure as prescribed under the, uh, the normal process which takes place in human life. So I said at that point of time that this narration is a must because then the judge also is convinced that this storytelling that you are doing is culled out from this volume of uh, evidence which is uh, before him and he starts trusting your way of looking. That's the practical side of it. If you are so well versed with the facts, the judge is convinced See, law takes always takes a back seat when the facts are there. Law cannot act in vacuum. Law has to act on facts. The law is there, already there. It is the appreciation of facts which comes in. And when you narrate the facts and you will be story telling it in your own version, articulating it in your own manner, you will also intersperse it with the human behavior. What is necessary? What was the mens rea required? Whether I had the animus to kill the person, whether I had the animus to hit the person, whether I had the animus to cheat the person, all those things will start flowing A, B, C, D. And in that, uh, the stream from Gangotri till Bay of Bengal will start flowing in that, that fashion. After that comes your leading the person to the evidence. What's the evidence? In the evidence, I had uh, said that you will need to check the omissions also, what the prosecution should have done and they have not done. So take care of those omissions also and inform the court that this is where I have not had a fair trial. So I am challenging that, that there is unfairness in trial I am, and I am constitutionally entitled to a fair trial. Then comes trying to interpose the different uh, evidences and the aspects of uh, what's the inconsistency in testimony. Besides the inconsistency in testimony, you will also show if the testimony of a person, how it is belied otherwise by documents, etc., by the exhibits which are there. In this entire exercise, I said that I have developed as a habit over the years, breaking the testimony that a particular person, a particular witness may be relevant for six points. I don't believe that a person should continually read from the page one till page X, his entire testimony, like just like a storybook and the end and then keep it aside, no. You want your appeal to be heard. You want to show how you are right. Your uh, understanding of the situation is right and the impugned judgment is wrong. So you pick out, you break the testimony into comfortable, convenient, consumable pieces. You pick out that part and then juxtapose it with the relevant ones to show and highlight your point. That's what I had mentioned and the human reactions and uh, human behavior because that's uh, mens rea is an important aspect in criminal law. You will need to show how something is incredible or something is unbelievable or something is incorrect. All those aspects will come in at that time of your argument. So don't bring in your argument as a cart before the horse. It has to be the horse first, give the facts, then carry the load of your arguments. Your arguments will hit the nail on the head once the facts have been absorbed by the judge in the proper manner, in the manner in which you want him. I believe that is what I had said. And I had also said, please bear in mind that as an appellate court, there is a presumption in appeal. There is a presumption that the impugned order is valid. 
and is right is justified so you have an uphill task so when you have an uphill task save your breath and then go slow wait for reactions to come from the court because if you rush it or you make it very dreary and a drudgery you will lose the impact that's on the practical side of it obviously each one to himself how you wish to point your case that's what i said i i hope mr chatrath 